Excerpts from the book From Oblivion to Hamden Hibs Heroes of 1991 Read by me Part 5 The Final Countdown Cup finals are won by the team who cope best with the nerves Alex Miller All the pressure is on Hibs Jockey Scott Hibs had never beaten a supposedly lesser team in a major cup final before. The Scottish Cup final wins of 1886-87 against Dumbarton at Hamden and against Celtic at Parkhead in 1901-02 had been against teams of equal ability in those days. The glorious defeat of Jock Steen's formidable Celtic side by Turnbull's Tornadoes at Hamden in the 1972 League Cup final had also been against opponents of more or less equal strength. Hugh Shaw's Hibs had been suckered by Motherwell in the 1950-51 League Cup final, losing 3-0 having lost the influential Eddie Turnbull to injury in the build-up. Motherwell, a top-flight side, but a very mediocre one, had scored three goals in the last 15 minutes before a Hamden crowd in excess of 65,000. Hibs did win the league that season, though, and the one after that. The 1968-69 season was to be the next time that Hibernian contested a League Cup final. That was at Hamden in April 1969, in front of 75,000 fans, when Bob Shankly's Hib side took on Jock Steen's Celtic. The final had been postponed since the previous October because Hamden had been damaged by a serious fire. In this match, Hibs were simply annihilated. Celtic led 6-0 after 73 minutes, though Late strikes from Eric Stevenson and Jimmy O'Rourke made the final score slightly more respectable at 6-2. The 74-75 season saw those same two clubs contest the final again, Joe Harper scoring a hat-trick for Eddie Turnbull's Hibs. Unfortunately, Dixie Deans did the same for Celtic at the other end and three other Celtic players scored, giving a final score of Hibs 3, Celtic 6 in what was nonetheless a thrilling match. In 1985, of course, John Blackley's Hibs were beaten 3-0 by Alex Ferguson's Aberdeen at Hamden in the Skull League Cup final. Aberdeen were perhaps the best team in Scotland back then, though. The superstitious and statistically minded supporters among us in 1991 were, however, aware of two instances when Hibs had lost finals, albeit in the other cup, to supposedly lesser teams. Hugh Shaw's men had lost the 1958 Scottish Cup final to Clyde at Hamden, one now in front of almost 100,000 fans. Though again, Clyde were a decent side at that time. Going further back, Alec Maley's Hibs had been stunned by Airdrie in the 1924 Scottish Cup final, losing 2 now at Ibrox in front of 60,000 fans, largely thanks to dodgy refereeing. But as we Clyde in 1958, Airdrie weren't a bad side in 1924. Nevertheless, those two final defeats had been sore ones for Hibs. In October of 1991, as Cup Final Day dawned, Brian Adams was still at number one in the charts with Everything I Do, his single from that movie, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. It had been number one for 16 weeks, so it had been top of the charts throughout Hibs' Skull Cup run and revival, although it was finally replaced by U2's The Fly on the day of the 1991 League Cup Final. Adams' song had been shadowed at number two by Right Said Fred's I'm Too Sexy for 11 of th those 16 weeks. Clearly, neither song was a terrace anthem, but would Hibbs new brand of confident passing football at Hamden prove too sexy for the pars? Really sorry, that was terrible humour, eh? That week, 
Poland was amid its first free democratic election since the fall of the Iron Curtain, while Cambodia's genocidal civil war had just ended after peace talks in Paris. There seemed to be a wind of change in the world. At the cinema, Alan Parker's superb movie The Commitments was taking the box office by storm. Like Hibernian, that film had soul. Hibs and the Pars had met in the League Cup before. The most recent encounter had been at Easter Road in 1989, where the Pars had actually knocked us out 3-1 after extra time. That was a sore one. However, 1991 was the first time that Dunfermline had reached the League Cup final since season 49-50, and the closest they'd gotten to doing so since they had been in the semi-finals in 89-90 after knocking out Hibs, but in the semi they were slaughtered 5-0 by Rangers. The Pars had, however, won the Scottish Cup twice in the 1960s, which was more than Hibs could say in 1991. Like Hibs, the Pars had won four games to reach the final. Aloha had been hammered 4-1 at East End Park. St Mirren had been defeated on penalties at East End Park after a 1-1 draw and again at East End Park, Dundee United had been beaten 3-1 in the quarter-finals before the Pars had somewhat unfortunately got past Airdrie on penalties at Tynecastle in the semis. Dunfermline had played all of their ties except the semi-final at home. Hibs had played all of their ties except the semi-final away from home. The League Cup aside, Dunfermline's start to the league season had been simply dreadful. Prior to the final, they had played 13 games, losing 11 times and drawing twice, conceding 33 goals and scoring four. Their manager, Ian Munro, who had played for Hibs in the 1985 League Cup final against Aberdeen, was sacked after a 2-1 defeat at home to Airdrie in the league just 10 days before the Pars were due to meet them again in the semi-finals. Experienced former Dundee boss Jockey Scott had took over at East End Park, going through in the semi-final against Airdrie but actually doing very little to improve the Pars league form. After that semi-final, he lost the next match 4-1 at home to St Mirren. Dunfermline's next match after that had been a trip to Easter Road in the league for a cup final dress rehearsal. Fewer than 8,000 fans saw Hibs comprehensively defeat Jockey Scott's side 3-0 with goals from Gordon Hunter, Pat McGinley and Keith Wright. Hibs could have won by a few more were it not for Andy Rhodes and Dunfermline's goal. Striker Mark McGraw was taken off with an injury in that match and was ruled out until the end of November. That was a real shame. Hibs were unbeaten in 14 games but their run came to an end one week after the thrashing of Dunfermline at Easter Road. Alex Miller's men went down 4-2 to Rangers at Ibrox on the 8th of October in a pulsating midweek match in which four of the goals were scored in the last 15 minutes. Pat McGinley and Mickey Weir had scored for Hibs. However, after that, Hibs beat St Mirren 1-0 at Love Street and then drew 0-0 with Motherwell in the two league games before the final to go to Hamden having lost just one match in 17 fixtures. The Pars approached the final still without a league win. Jockey Scott's team did have some fine players. They had Andy Rhodes in goals, the hero of the semi-final. And they had their formidable skipper and centre half, Nori McCarthy, who is sadly no longer with us. They also had Istvan Kozma, the classy Hungarian playmaker signed in 1989 from Bordeaux for a club record of £550,000. He later went on to play for Liverpool. That's right, Dunfermline once paid more than half a million quid for a player. This isn't the twilight zone, by the way. 
A certain Davy Moyes partnered McCarthy at the back for the pars and they had Billy Davis and Scott Leach, talented Scottish midfielders, as well as ex-Rangers man Ian McCall, who was back for a second spell. Dunfermline's best forward, George O'Boyle, didn't make the final squad because of injury. On paper, it looked like Hibs Cup. We had the momentum and we had the better players, but cup matches can surprise you. Maybe Miller's men would, as some say nowadays, do a Hibs and blow it. It was all down to 90 minutes of football in which anything could happen. Hibs made two changes to the side that had beaten Rangers in the semi-final. Gareth Evans played from the start in place of the injured Mark McGraw, while new signing Dave Beaumont, yet to make his debut, took Gareth Evans' place beside Neil Orr on the bench. Hibs had two substitutes who could play in defence or midfield, but there were no attacking options in reserve. Alec Miller was setting out to win the game with his starting eleven. The powers that be had decreed that the cup final would be pay at the gate, though tickets could also be bought, costing £7 for adults or £2 for kids, typically depending where you went. The programme cost £2 and the match would be overseen by referee Brian McGinley. As well as being shown on terrestrial TV in Scotland, the final was also shown on Sky outside of Scotland. So Britain and the world would be watching. The lineups were for Hibs. Number one, John Burridge. Number two, Willie Miller. Number three, Graham Mitchell. Number four, Gordon Hunter. Number five, Tommy McIntyre. Number six, Murdo McLeod. Number seven, Mickey Weir. Number eight, Brian Hamilton. Number nine, Keith Wright. Number 10, Gareth Evans. And number 11, Pat McGinley. Substitutes were Neil Orr and Dave Beaumont, wearing numbers 12 and 14. Dunfermline lined up with Andy Rhodes, Tom Wilson, Ray Sharp, Norrie McCarthy, Davey Moyes, Craig Robertson, Derek McWilliams, Istvan Cosma, Scott Leach, Billy Davis, Chris Sinclair, and on the bench they had Ian McCall and Eddie Cunnington. Who? Just over 40,000 people were at Hamden to see Hibs and Dunfermline contest the 1991 Skull League Cup final. Around a quarter of them were Pars fans housed in the Rangers end of the stadium, the covered terrace, and also in part of the main stand. The High B faithful had the rest of the terrace in and part of the main stand. Those in attendance were treated to pre-match entertainment. A Scottish pipe band was on the pitch from 2pm. Then at 2.20pm the Russian All-Stars gymnastics troupe took to the field to entertain those who had arrived early. There was then a grand balloon release, no doubt triggering jokes among fans about what balloons they'd like to see their own club release. Many fans missed these pre-match entertainments either because they were still in pubs or were having problems accessing the ground. The former was to be expected but the latter was caused by the pay at the gate policy which kind of resulted in a bit of a farce. Many turnstiles were closed when their section still had plenty of room. Some Hibs fans had to go incognito into the Dunfermline end but that resulted in no trouble. Sadly, as many as 5,000 Hibs fans were denied entry to the ground and had to watch the game in the pub. The only defence for some turnstiles closing early would, could be that the powers that be were surprised just by how big the crowd was, having expected a smaller one. And with the Hillsborough disaster still fresh in the memories of all, the authorities played it safe. Nevertheless, on this day, they kind of got it wrong. Sponsor Skull Lager was offering a few prizes on Cup Final Day. The winning team would get £25,000 and the runners-up would get £20,000. Each team would get £600 per goal, excluding penalties, and that would rise to £800 per goal scored if there were more than three scored in the game. Skull's man of the match would receive a pair of Skull Crystal Goblets. Whoever scored the game's final goal 
would win a £1,000 designer Rolex wristwatch. And there was the aforementioned prize for the tournament's top scorer of a romantic holiday plus spending money. A romantic holiday for two. Who would win those prizes? But more importantly, who would win the big prize? The big match, one step from immortality. Dunfermline got the match underway and carved out the first chance, Cosma setting up Scott Leach for a shot from the edge of the box which sailed over the bar. It was a nervous start by both teams who initially looked scared to make any mistakes. Hibs were the first to look genuinely dangerous. Gareth Evans, who appeared hungry, picked up the ball outside the box with his back to goal and then turned and hit a shot, but Andy Rhodes was equal to, it, to, the, to the effort, catching it without losing his footing. Hibs were attacking the Rangers' end of the ground in the first half, the end which housed the Pars fans. Incidentally, Dunfermline are called the Pars as it's an acronym for Plymouth Argyle Reserves. Look it up. Willie Mower then thumped the ball down the right wing to Gareth Evans, who was dispossessed, but Mickey Weir and Brian Hamilton combined to regain possession and slid the ball back out to Evans on the wing. Evans sent in a dangerous cross, which Mickey Weir, the smallest man on the park, headed goalwards from eight yards, but the ball struck the post and went out of play. Scott Leach then scooped another half chance well over the bar at the other end. The chant of Come on ye pars was answered by a resounding chorus of High bees, high bees, high bees from the huge green and white army. Derek McWilliams then burst down the flank and crossed for Scott Leach but again the attacking midfielder shot well wide. Willie Miller made another run down the right and after a clever pass from Weir, crossed into the box. Davy Moyes headed the ball out to Pat McGinley on the edge of the box, but the midfielder miscued his shot. Then, good work on the left from Mitchell and Keith Wright gave Mickey Weir a half chance, but the little winger was under pressure and his shot from 10 yards went just over the bar. It wasn't exactly Roy of the Rover stuff from either side in the first half. The best chance came after 32 minutes when Keith Wright pounced on a slack 40-yard back pass from Dunfermline left-back Ray Sharp. Wright was one-on-one -on -one with Andy Rhodes, but the keeper di dived at Keith's feet to smother the ball, saving Ray Sharp's blushes. Blushes, even. Sharp almost caused another goal moments later when he needlessly passed the ball across his own defence, but Hibs didn't capitalise, and at half-time the score remained nil-nil. The Hibs had been nowhere near their best. Dunfermline had looked hard-working, but devoid of any creativity. Pars fans would have been delighted to still be in the game, given their league form at the time. For Hibs fans, it was different. Deep down, many of us knew that if our team didn't score early in the second half, Dunfermline would grow in confidence and might just nick a goal and then would simply sit on that lead. The green jerseys needed to score first, as much to ease the nerves of the legions supporting them from the terraces, watching at home or in pubs as for themselves. At half time, Alex Miller, notorious for his interval roastings, used a different approach. He calmly reminded the players that they were better than the pars man for man and as a team and that all they needed to do was relax and take control of the game and in doing so they would gain their deserved reward. No substitutions were made at half time and Hibs got the second half underway shooting towards their own fans. It was like Hibs had upped a gear in the second half as they meant business from the off. The green jerseys immediately forced a corner that Dunfermline's defence cleared to the edge of the box from where Gareth Evans unleashed a rasping half volley which went inches over the bar. 
The Hibs fans, who completely surrounded Dunfermline's half in the second period, sensed that the team's dander was up and roared encouragement to their heroes. A high B Hamden roar, followed by a deafening chorus of high bees. There then followed an equally deafening chorus of hail, hail. And after that, with 48 minutes gone, Mickey Weir played a neat 1-2 with Keith Wright and burst into the box, only to be fouled by the hapless Ray Sharp, who grabbed at Mickey's waist, but was unable to bring the Hibs star down. However, it was enough to make Mickey Weir miss kick and fall over. So, three quarters of the stadium roared, Pen away! And referee Brian McGinley had no hesitation in pointing to the spot. The award caused another roar among the Hibs fans, who saw it as their just reward. Tommy McIntyre, by prior arrangement with Alex Miller, was the designated penalty taker, having scored from the spot against St Johnston earlier in the season. This time he was four minutes into the second half of a cup final with a guilt-edged chance to put Hibernian 1-0 up. The hopes of over 30,000 fans on the terraces and of thousands of more watching elsewhere were on his shoulders. Tommy had only regained his place in the Hibs team at the tail end of the previous season, having not featured at all in almost two years after being substituted at Hamden in the 1989 Scottish Cup semi-final loss against Celtic. The penalty that he was about to take was at the same end of Hamden, where he had made mistakes in that game. Dunfermline's Andy Rhodes was a proven penalty stopper and his side wouldn't have been in the final were it not for his heroics in the semi-final shootout against Airdrie and in the earlier shootout against St Mirren. It was the most important single kick of a football in the 27-year life of defender Tommy McIntyre. Tommy ignored Andy Rhodes' body language on the line and stepped up. Loud chants of Andy, 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 Andy emanated from the Dunfermline fans in an attempt to inspire their keeper to more heroics. McIntyre, composure personified, coolly stroked the ball with his right foot into Rhodes' bottom left corner, sending the goalie sprawling the wrong way. 1-0 to Hibs. The Hibs support erupted and some say the cheer could be heard for miles. So overjoyed and relieved we were that our heroes had taken the lead. The pressure was off Hibs. The pressure too was off Tommy McIntyre, who with that one shot exercised the ghosts of his and the team's 1989 Hamden disappointment. The joy and relief on his face were evident as he was mobbed by jubilant teammates, Delighted for him as much as they were for Hibs and the fans. From then on in, it was all about the Hibs. Mickey Weir had a shot from the edge of the box, which went just wide as the Hibs songbook was given a full outing, with the lacklustre pars seeming a little shell-shocked after the goal. Though to their credit... They never gave up. Nevertheless, Mickey Weir continued tormenting their defence, giving Ray Sharp an afternoon to forget. As daylight faded and the floodlights took over, a beautiful aspect of the old Skull Cup finals when they were played in October, everybody in the stadium knew that one more Hibs goal would finish it. But without one, there was always the chance that Dunfermline could nick an equaliser and ruin everything. 
Mickey Weir went on a run that got him into the position in which he had been fouled for the penalty. But this time, he blasted a shot across that Rhodes did well to keep out. The pars brought on Ian McCall for Chris Sinclair after an hour. Istvan Cosma, a virtual passenger for much of the game, blasted a 35-yard free kick over John Burridge's bar, wasting a rare opportunity for the pars. Dunfermline's best chance of the game came after 75 minutes, when Sharp got it right for once, playing in Scott Leach, who cleverly backheeled the ball to Billy Davis, whose fine shot from the edge of the box was smothered by John Burridge, Budgie's first real save of the game. Ray Sharp was then replaced by Eddie Cunnington, a defender for a defender, and an odd move by Jockey Scott. Then again, he only had two subs. Ian McCall and Istvan Cosma then combined to set up Scott Leach again, but again he blasted the ball wide from 12 yards out. And after that, with 10 minutes remaining, Hib sensed that their opponents had run out of ideas and run out of steam. So the High Bees went for the jugular, having weathered Dunfermline's 10 minute spell of pressure. Pat McGinley headed a Miller cross just wide. Then, Five minutes from the end, Mickey Weir and Gareth Evans dispossessed Cunnington before Weir sent a lovely through ball to Keith Wright, sending the striker hurtling through on goal. Norrie McCarthy and Davy Moyes couldn't catch Keith Wright, who placed the ball beyond the advancing Andy Rhodes and into the bottom corner of the net. 2-0 to Hibs. The Hibs fans erupted in rapturous joy as Keith ran towards them with his arms in the air with his trademark celebration before his teammates caught up with him and mobbed him with their congratulations and one of those big footballer group hugs. Alec Miller had looked pleased but still on edge after McIntyre's opener. But then, when Keith Wright's shot hit the back of the net, the Hibs manager was jumping around for joy, punching the air and shouting with excitement like a giddy child. Not your usual impression of the old gaffer, is it? Alex Miller knew that the game was up, but Hibs still pushed for more as the dejected par's heads went down. The Pars players knew it was all over, yet they still had four minutes plus stoppage time to play. In those four minutes, Brian Hamilton smashed a 25-yard thunderbolt off the post, the ball having been rolled to him by Mick Mickey Weir from a free kick just outside the box. And then Pat McGinley volleyed a Graham Mitchell cross just wide. The Pars lumped the ball forwards in the dying seconds in a bid to take the pressure off and Gordon Hunter, with the last kick of the game, booted the ball clear as Brian McGinley blew the final whistle. In that instant, with that whistle, all of the pain, heartbreak, fear and misery that had clouded Hibs in the previous season and even in the run-up to the current campaign instantly became just a memory. The green jerseys had triumphed, not just over Dunfermline Athletic or the other four teams whom they had eliminated from the tournament, but over adversity itself. It finished Hibernian 2, Dunfermline Athletic 0. 
Hibs had won the League Cup. From Sheriff's officers at Easter Road back in July to Hamden Glory just four months later, the Highbies had bounced back in dramatic fashion, winning theirs and Edinburgh's first major trophy in 19 years and qualifying for the UEFA Cup in the process. It was as much a victory for the fans too, who had been through so much and had endured uncertainty, snide jokes and taunts for a year. But it was the cabbage who were laughing now, because Hibs were back from the brink, from zeros to heroes. The trophy was in the bag and there were still no cups in Gorgie. Wallace Mercer's theory that Edinburgh's clubs couldn't enjoy success on their own had been blown to pieces. Back then, Hamden Park didn't stage-manage cup wins with piped music on the PA like it does now, so there was no single rendition by Hibs fans after the game. Instead, many different songs were being sung all across the terraces by large groups of Hibs fans at different times, creating a real carnival atmosphere on the Hamden terraces and in its rickety old main stand. There was a huge rapturous cheer once more as the heroes in green climbed the famous Hamden steps to receive the two trophies and their, and their winner's medals. Skipper Murdo McLeod held the League Cup aloft and the fans erupted once more. He and Willie Miller grabbed the League Cup and the Skull Cup and made their way back onto the pitch, denying the other team members a chance to hold the cup aloft to the fans. But in truth, after everything that had happened, no one was bothered about that. One song stood out after the final whistle at Hamden that day. Champions! Champions! It was more or less constant at each point in the stadium, at some point, where the Hibs fans waited to salute their victorious conquering heroes. Alex Miller's Green White Army also got a loud airing, which must have pleased the boss. Just a few months Previous to that success, some fans had still been calling for his head. Alex Miller had proved them wrong. So wrong. Hibs had done it in one of the most remarkable episodes in Scottish football's history. They'd been 40-1 to to win the cup when the tournament began and legend has it that the players even had a cheeky wee collective modest bet on themselves to win it at those odds. Keith Wright was a hero, having scored in every round and he'd sealed the win on the day, becoming the tournament's joint top scorer with Mo Johnston on five goals each. Thankfully, the sponsors didn't make Keith and Mo go on that romantic holiday prize together. Instead, sensibly, Skull gave each of them a holiday. Keith also received the limited edition Rolex watch for scoring the tournament's final goal. Mickey Weir was the man of the match and thus won a pair of stylish skull crystal goblets. His trickery, vision and tenacity and skill had been too much for Dunfermline's defence and too much for the defences of the teams in the previous four rounds. Keith Wright and Mickey Weir would go down in history as the cup wins big stars but perhaps the other individual hero was the man from Motherwell. Tommy McIntyre, who had showed great courage, composure and maturity to, Gibbs Hib, to give Hibs the lead. In truth though, they were all heroes. The defence had soaked up everything thrown at it in every round of the tournament. John Burridge had been the experienced head between the sticks that the team needed. Hibs midfield had, in every round, won all of its personal duels and had played for each other. The strikers had provided the necessary goals in running and manager Alex Miller had masterminded the whole glorious affair. There was wee, one tiny wee odd point. Dave Beaumont, through no fault of his own, picked up a winner's medal despite not playing in the match and not even having made his Hibs debut yet. While Mark McGraw, a key player in three of the rounds, didn't get a medal because he was out injured for the final. Callum Milne had also played well in two rounds but got no medal. Neil Orr did get a medal as he was on the bench but he'd also done his bit in the earlier rounds. 
Davy Fellinger, who had only played after coming on as a substitute late in the win at Rugby Park in round three, also got no medal. Perhaps everyone who featured for Hibs in the tour tournament deserved one, but at the time the, that wasn't how the SFL's rules went. Dunfermline had tried hard, but were ultimately no match for Hibs, and they were lucky to have not conceded more goals, although they were able to hold their heads high, as were their fans who sang throughout the match. Dunfermline only managed one shot on target to Hibs 6, with 7 off target to the victors 9. Istvan Cosma and Ray Sharp were their worst performers by far. Cosma had the ability but was too lazy to use it, while Sharp had the energy but not the ability. Nori McCarthy was probably Dunfermline's best player that day, desperately trying to hold his beloved team together, but that wasn't enough. After team photos with the trophy and a lap of honour by the victorious players, Hibs fans, coaches and players alike suddenly realised that they faced a desperate dash back to Edinburgh to see the cup brought back to Easter Road on an open top bus. Again, something which had been unthinkable even six months earlier. So, a green and white tide ebbed westwards, back to Scotland's capital, back to that beautiful wee stadium that sits in the shadow of Arthur's seat, back home to Easter Road for a party. It was to be a party such as most had never been to before. Hibernian FC had walked through the storm with their heads held high and had never walked alone. That song, with many others, would soon be echoing around Edinburgh and Easter Road on that October Sunday night in 1991, after Hibernian, the team that would not die, and its fans, got ready to celebrate, Edinburgh style. Those players were immortals now, heroes to young and old alike and will never be forgotten. Hibbs' journey from the jaws of death to cup glory in 1991 was perhaps best summed up by a large homemade banner on the open terracing at the National Stadium. It simply read, From Oblivion to Hamden.